So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Oneida County History Center's virtual lunchtime lecture, um, The Politics of Translation with Dr. Peter Van Cleve. Um, we are lucky enough he is broadcasting or, you know, live all the way from Arizona, where he is a professor of history and I believe clinical, I can't remember the second half, the clinical <laughs> online program. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over the screen to Peter. Um, enjoy and let us know if you have any questions. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, for the invitation to speak. I'm uh, pulling up my slides right now. So I'm, I'm trying out a new feature in Zoom in which the, the slides will appear as my background. Um, so it, it, uh, anyone has any issues, I'll, I'll have the chat open actually, um, just in case uh, you could post something there if there's anything wrong with the, the picture or the, the feed or anything like that. Um, so th thank you to, to everyone for, for joining and, and for your interest um, in translations and your interest in the, the history of the, the translations of the New Netherland records. So for our talk today, we're going to be discussing what, what I'm calling the political history of the Albany records. So first and foremost, I just wanted to offer a bit of background on what I mean by the Albany records, kind of to, to set the stage for what those are, because I'm sure some of you are probably wondering, what in the world are the Albany records? So the, the Albany records um, was the term that was used for the first English language translations of the documents of the New Netherland colony. Um, it was a project that um, was undertaken from 1817 to 1822 at the behest of, of New York State, and in particular, Governor DeWitt Clinton. So of, of note, this project actually uh, continues to this day. So uh, Charles Gehring, who I actually believe I saw uh, is attending this talk, um, and uh, Yanni Venema um, in, in Albany with the New Netherland Research Center are still working tirelessly on translating these documents from New Netherland and bringing the history of the Dutch North American colony to new generations of, of scholars and, and students of history. So when I talk about the, the politics of translation or the, the politics of the Albany records, I am talking about politics in, in two ways. So first, uh, the first topic we're going to explore, uh, let me get to my topic slide. Um, so the first one we're gonna explore is, is literally politics, right? So party politics, partisan infighting, and, and we're gonna look at the ways in which the politics of New York State in really the 1810s and 1820s affected the production of the records themselves. So, so how did party politics shape the records, but also too, how are the records a reflection and representation of the political changes that New York State was going through um, at the beginning of the 19th century. And then really the, the second half of the presentation is going to be about the politics of historical memory. And what I mean about this is really asking questions about what documents get saved, whose story gets told, and who gets to tell that story. So really we're talking about issues of power, um, issues of memory, issues of representation when it comes to thinking about the history of, in our case, right, New York State. And then finally, I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up with the, the intersection of these two and really what um, is the centerpiece of, of my research and, and, and my project, which is, is looking at the legacy of the Dutch specifically in the early American Republic. Um, so um, if you know anything about the kind of history of, of Dutch American history, there's a, a lot of really terrific work on the colony. There's a lot of really terrific work on Dutch immigration in the late 19th century. So what um, you know, historians call the second wave of immigration, you know, thinking Ellis Island, those types of things. What is often left out um, is the early American Republic, so the early 1800s, the 1810s, the 1820s. So just kind of thinking about that and thinking about the, the role of the Albany records and the role of the translations in that history. And so when it comes to the Albany records, we're gonna be focusing really on a particular individual. Um, and this is Francis Adrian Vanderkamp. So this is actually the only known portrait um, of Vanderkamp, he had this painted when he was in jail uh, for his wife. Um, but we'll actually get to that in, in a little bit. Um, but Vanderkamp 
um, is the one who translated the record. So he was the one, the sole person, um, well, actually, I shouldn't say sole person. His daughter actually helped him a lot with uh, the translations. Van der Kemp was born in Kampen over Isol in the Netherlands in 1752. Uh, during the age of revolutions, Van der Kemp, like a lot of people, got swept up by the revolutionary fervor, and he joined a group of revolutionaries in the Netherlands who were inspired by the American Revolution and sought some of those same changes in the Dutch Republic. You know, greater representation, a more democratic structure um, when it came to the kind of um, power of the provinces uh, within kind of Dutch uh, governance. And so he, grow, he joined a group that were, they called themselves the Patriots. And so the Patriots were a, a group of, of individuals, politicians, ordinary people, who in large part were pushing the state's general and to recognize the United States as a sovereign nation. They also wanted the state's general to recognize John Adams as the official ambassador of the United States to the Netherlands. In large part, of course, so, they, so Adams, from his point of view, could secure loans, um, some of which the Dutch had already been uh, donating to the United States. It's a, a lecture for a different time, but the role of the Dutch in the American Revolution is something that is largely glossed over um, when we consider, you know, again, say like the French um, or the Spanish. So as Van der Kemp was moving in these revolutionary circles, uh, of course, he came in contact with, with John Adams. So they met in Leiden in 1781, and they became quite close. So from their meeting in 1781 until Adams' death in 1824, uh, they corresponded constantly. I think it's there at the Massachusetts Historical Society, but there's about 800 letters uh, between the two of them that span uh, this period. So... As Vanderkamp is, is pushing the Netherlands uh, toward kind of recognizing the American Revolution, in the Netherlands itself, there was a, another kind of revolution brewing. And so as the American Revolution was finding its success, as it, and the United States actually gained recognition, particularly right from Great Britain in 1783, the Dutch were really just beginning their revolt. Um, so the Dutch Patriot Revolt, as it's known, runs from 1781 to about 1788. Vanderkemp was a key figure in this movement, uh, using his skills as a writer, a petitioner, a minister. Um, he also literally led a militia unit uh, during the war. Um, but the movement in the Netherlands, unlike the American Revolution, um, had no help, right? Uh, there were no outside influences that supported the Dutch Patriots. The French paid some lip service to helping, but nothing actually ever came through. And so in 1788, um, actually it was the Prussian uh, military swept through the Netherlands and um, broke up most of the militia units, even jailing many dissenters, including Vanderkamp himself. So he spent about 24 weeks in jail. This is when this portrait actually was painted. Um, when, when he was in jail, he was unsure of what was going to happen to him. Luckily, there were some, some people uh, on the outside who maneuvered to get Vanderkamp freed. But upon um, his release, he was essentially told he was not only banned from the province of Utrecht, where he was arrested, but pretty much any other province in the Netherlands um, was going to be unwelcome to Vanderkamp. So he contacted his good friend John Adams, um, and he secured passage to the United States. And so in 1788, Vanderkamp and his family arrived in the United States where they lived for the rest of their lives. And Vanderkamp's connection to Oneida County began in, in 17, 1797 when he moved onto a parcel of land uh, that was gifted to him by the Holland Land Company. Uh, so the Holland Land Company was a consortium of Dutch bankers who purchased about 5 million acres of land in central and western New York, as well as western Pennsylvania. And of course, this being a Dutch company, backed by Dutch investors, it was also run by Dutch superintendents, many of whom knew Vanderkamp. Um, and so his friend, Adam Mappa, who was also a Dutch patriot um, and working for the Hall of Land Company, offered him uh, land, um, offered him a, a place to, to stay. And so he moved to Oneida County. Uh, and there he really became a fixture of the region. Um, he served as a justice of the peace. Um, probably his greatest success was he founded a church um, in 
1803 it was known then as the United Protestant Religious Society. It is known today as the Unitarian Church of Barneveld. Um, and he, he also had a kind of fleet of contacts that, that he kept in communication, brought their information into Nauta County, brought a perspective um, from Central New York to others. So in addition to Adams, he also is exchanging letters with Thomas Jefferson, um, exchanging letters with George Washington. In fact, when he first arrived in the United States, he visited Mount Vernon. Um, Washington actually noted it in his diary, which was fairly unusual for Washington's diary, which is mostly a kind of collection of mundane things that were happening uh, that day. So Vanderkamp kind of broke through that. Um, others that he talked to, James Madison, and then of course, DeWitt Clinton, um, who was the one that secured Vanderkamp the job of translating the Albany records. So for the Albany records, it was uh, January of 1817, DeWitt Clinton asked Vanderkamp, who, who at that point was uh, 65 years old, was actually going blind. Um, Vanderkamp uh, was really concerned that he would be unable to finish the Albany records uh, because his eyesight wouldn't hold up. Uh, and, and of course, his treatment didn't help matters. So in order to help his eyesight, he poured poison into his eyes. He poured belladonna into his eyes, which naturally did not work. Um, and so, you know, working over these documents, um, you know, trying to produce the, these translations, he, he suffered in, in terms of health, but he saw this as an important sacrifice. And so he worked from 1817, so January of 1817 to September of 1822. And in that time, he produced 24 folio volumes, which equaled, uh, equaled 10,206 pages of uh, translation. So. Vanderkamp never did lose his sight. However, the, his effort did not match his spirit. Uh, the translations themselves were quite poor. Uh, scholars who later consulted the Albany records um, criticized the, the document uh, quite readily. So E.B. O'Callaghan, writing in 1865, recommended actually the translation should be done completely over. Um, he said, quote, not all, they were not only incorrect and unreliable, but incomplete with several parts and pages of the original having been left untranslated. Later in 1910, A.J.F. Van Lair, um, who declared the records, quote, absolutely worthless for critical historical work and summed up the effort as so poor that it need not be considered at all. So, the fate of the Albany records, though, um, met a demise that actually, in part, equaled the criticism that the records received. So in 1911, a fire broke out in the New York State Capitol, and amongst the documents that succumbed to the flames were, in fact, the records, um, an act that I imagine Van Lair considered a divine public service. So this lack of records to compare um, uh, against the, the originals led to a kind of brief period where people started to praise Vanderkamp again. So in particular, Harry Jackson, who was a professor of history at Utica College and wrote the only biography on, a book link biography, I should say, on Vanderkamp, um, argued that, you know, we'll never know um, how, how good these translations are. Uh, another scholar, Vivian Hopkins, even went further in saying, there's no chance to, to vindicate the work that Vanderkamp did. However, not all of the Albany records were destroyed. Uh, Charles Gehring actually found two surviving volumes, uh, and then in comparing those volumes against the originals, more or less confirmed the, uh, Van Lair's comments and O'Callaghan's comments that the, the records as translations um, simply were not that good. Um, so I've actually written elsewhere about uh, a reinterpretation of, of the documents, which I'm not gonna necessarily talk about here, but instead what we're going to focus on is really the, the role of the documents themselves rather than um, kind of defending Vanderkamp um, as a translator. Right? I think it's fair to say that as translations, the Albany records were, were fairly irredeemable. Fortunately, however, the original New Netherland documents um, survived. They were actually on, there were a bunch of English documents on top of them, so they burned and the original Dutch documents were preserved. And it's written, in some ways, it's the serendipity of that moment um, that is, is reflective of the Albany records and much of what I'm gonna be talking about today. 
So for the Albany records itself, it, it highlights that there's a, a richer history to uncover with those, do, those records than just poor translations. Um, it was a crucial moment for Dutch history in the United States and in New York in particular. Um, and it was Vanderkamp whose labor, although flawed, provided an essential correction to the current understanding of Dutch history and the current understanding of New Netherland. For the colony itself, it reveals that below the surface of English records, uh, there's actually a legacy of the Dutch that we're still uncovering today. So we, we then moved it into the, the, the politics of, of the Dutch records, of the Albany records, and its inclusion in the politics of New York State. So this was also a moment in which New York was uh, rising, it, its population was growing exponentially. So at the start of the revolution, Philadelphia was the most populous city, probably the most famous city in the United States, the, the city where most of the kind of intellectual and cultural life ran through when you think of the United States broadly. We're talking about also the period in which New York State is beginning to overtake um, Philadelphia as that. Uh, we're seeing a lot of migration that's coming through uh, New York State, and all of these um, are going to have an impact on the records in one way or another. So for the entirety of the project and, and the entirety of Vanderkamp's work on the project, um, politics, and in particular party politics in New York, created undue pressure and undermined the quality of the work he produced. As a state investment, the completion of the records became subject to the whims of the legislature and the growing opposition to Governor Clinton, its most vocal supporter. When it became clear that the translations had to be finished during Clinton's term as governor in order to guarantee funding, Vanderkamp made the decision to sacrifice quality for completion, uh, providing the fullest account that he could of the colony and of the records he was looking over. So the same year that Clinton petitioned to uh, begin the translations through Vanderkamp, he also began, a, began another mammoth project, right? The Erie Canal. So once Spade hit dirt in 1817, workers were building in, in both directions. And in fact, in 1822, the same year that Vanderkamp handed over his final volume, the, the canal extended from Schenectady to Rochester, um, a route that traveled just south of Vanderkamp's home in Olden Barneveld. So seemingly unrelated enterprises, right? The, the digging and building of a massive canal versus the translation uh, of Dutch documents. These two projects shared many of the same goals and I would argue emerged from similar origins. Uh, the fundamental purpose of both was to unite New Yorkers across time and space and each attested to the active role of government in the 1810s uh, and the 1820s. And more than anything though, the two projects give us a glimpse into the hardening and coalescing party politics and partisanship um, that is a hallmark of, of New York State. So partisanship, in fact, had always been a part uh, of New York political history, um, and you have a dizzying set of factions um, for, for much of New York political history. But what's changing in the 1820s is the normalization of partisanship and the hardening of party lines. The idea that political parties weren't necessarily detrimental to republicanism, de detrimental to democracy, but it could in fact arguably be used in the name of the people, right? That they could be stabilizing forces um, in, in a country that was still negotiating what a connection to the United States meant, what connection to New York State meant. And so in New York, you have the Bucktails, which was a, a faction of Democratic Republicans who had formed behind Martin Van Buren. And they put these ideas into practice, this idea of creating a party, creating unity within the party, and creating connection to the party. And of course, the group's main goal at this time was defeating Van Buren's nemesis and Vanderkamp's benefactor, DeWitt Clinton. So as with the canal, the completion of the records and the commitment of the state funds can't be separated from the person of DeWitt Clinton and his decision and his influence within New York politics. And so while we have the long-term trend was regularization of partisanship, um, at this point, politics in New York worked both through the party machinery of the Bucktails and Van Buren, as well as the personal influence of DeWitt Clinton. 
And so it was Clinton who secured the job for Vanderkamp. Um, and as a Clinton appointee, Vanderkamp had security from the governor's office as long as it was Clinton's to give. So whereas the canal's immense popularity and immediate dividends made strange political bedfellows, Van Buren wasn't going to attack uh, Clinton when it came to the Erie Canal, the records didn't share a similar appeal. So as the Bucktails moved from an oppositional faction to a party and came to dominate the state legislature in 1820, Vanderkamp worried that hostility to all things Clinton would in fact endanger the completion of the project. And so when Vanderkamp turned in his first sample in the spring of 1818, he had already expressed concerns about what a governorship without Clinton would mean for the records. He wrote, Clinton, I ought not, I cannot negotiate with others nor make myself dependent upon a future governor to whom I might be a stranger, he wrote to Clinton in March, nor was he willing to depend upon the whims of subordinate ministers. And so worry became trepidation in the wake of 1821 and the convention that was called to revise New York State Constitution. So Clinton had just recently won a desperately close reelection in 1820, and the Bucktails took aim at revising the state constitution, in part to make the original constitution from 1777 more democratic, but also certainly in part to undermine the power that Clinton had um, with, within the government. And so the resulting constitution marked a sweeping victory for the Bucktails. But for Vanderkamp, there were two specific developments that highlighted his tenuous position. So first, whereas the 1707 constitution granted the governor a term of three years, the new version reduced, reduced the term to two years, and it shifted the election date so that Clinton's term would end at the start of 1823. Second, the Constitution fundamentally changed the process of political appointments and transferred most of that authority to the legislature. So as a result, the new Constitution not only shortened Clinton's current term, it concurrently reduced the very authority he had used to appoint Vanderkamp in the first place. So in the face of such uh, opposition, DeWitt Clinton decided not to seek re-election in 1823, and that put a ticking clock on the Albany records. So Vanderkamp knew he had to finish the records by the end of 1822, and he began to rush through the documents. At the end of 1821, he expressed to Clinton, quote, would I to God, I could, as I proposed, have finished the whole during your excellency's administration, I would have exerted every nerve. He promised to continue his rapid pace, quote, if my vigor does not abate, if my eyes do not forsake me. Hamstrung by the Bucktails, many of whom were Yankees, which we'll get to the importance of that um, in the next section, Clinton informed Vanderkamp that he couldn't personally approve the expense and guarantee any funding beyond his own term. He hoped that if the records were successful, the government would approve future spending. And, and for his part, Clinton constantly defended the expenditures of the records. He made several public addresses on the importance of the records. He made sure his officials relayed the project status and annual reports. Um, he did what he could to promote the idea. Um, and well, so while Clinton and Vanderkamp both feared the future and what it held in terms of the records, both were clearly proud of the work being done on the Albany records. However, the worry that Clinton and Vanderkamp had um, in, in 1821 proved prescient when in September of 1822, Clinton started to receive pushback from members of the Bucktail Party about all of these payments going to Vanderkamp. So whereas the opposition couldn't touch Clinton when it came to the Erie Canal, they could put pressure on things like the Albany records. And so when Vanderkamp had an outstanding payment, Clinton received a letter from one of the state representatives questioning why the state should be spending money on translating Dutch documents. So Clinton forwarded this letter to Vanderkamp, um, who wrote that it, quote, has all the hues and cries of economy when so much money has been thrown away on musky records. He informed Clinton that the author of the letter does not know me if he presumes that it is in his power to humble me. He is digging a grave for himself while he rashly endeavors to undervalue one of your excellency's most glorious undertakings during your administration. So as Vanderkamp seized over this politicization of the records, and as he waited on his payment for the last records he submitted, the state went ahead and sent him a last volume uh, of records with no note of explanation and no promise of future repayment. Incensed, Vanderkamp decided, quote, 
I shall not touch nor even decipher a single line. So the dispute over the payment wasn't resolved by the time that Clinton finished his term and Vanderkamp never did receive his outstanding payment, nor did he translate the volume. He wrote Clinton in March of 1823, I have not the least intention to make one further step for the recovery of the compensation. Let the state remain my debtor. After that, Vanderkamp shifted his attention to projects, quote, not for the public, but for my successors. And when he did encounter projects on New Netherland, he directed them actually toward the New York Historical Society and not the state. And so there was a move away from state projects that reflected a larger process by which elements of legislative authority became subsumed by private enterprises. The Clinton administration's preference for a strong active government came under great scrutiny at this time, and it undermined the type of state funding on which the Albany records depended. So Vanderkamp's experience as a translator helped to illuminate the shifting nature of politics in New York during the 1820s and the splintering effects of strongly organized parties. The records also highlight some of the consequences of the decline of state authority and the reduction of public investment. More than anything, the politics of translation also provides some explanation of why Vanderkamp had to ultimately sacrifice quality and his sight for completion. <laughs> So we move now to the, the politics of historical memory. And so why party politics complicated the production of the records, put undue stress on Vanderkamp as he tried to, to finish. An equal concern of Vanderkamp's from 1817 and 1822 was trying to change the legacy of New Netherland and the image of the Dutch in American minds. So New York partisanship only affected the records as long as there was this debate about whether the state should pay for them or not. But the neglect of the Dutch colony in American city had been, or American history had been going on much longer. So the Clinton Van Buren schism ironically only added weights to Vanderkamp's arguments, uh, arguments he made about the Dutch ability to balance competing political interests and the need for a better understanding of Dutch American history. So in addition to politics, also key to understanding Vanderkamp's attempt to reclaim New Netherland is the contemporary history of New York in the early American Republic. So as Vanderkamp work, worked, New York became the most populous state in the Union, attracting a host of new settlers, including many Yankees from nearby New England. So as New Yorkers witnessed the building of the Erie Canal, felt the rippling social and religious effects of the market revolution, uh, they saw the expansion of democracy, the in normalization and intensification of party politics, and a generation born without a direct connection to the American Revolution grappled anew with what it meant to be American. So Vanderkamp's attempt to recapture Dutch history was a response to all of this upheaval in post-revolutionary New York. So as New York became in some ways this a new melting pot, he saw the records as an opportunity to present a model from the Dutch colony uh, of how a politically and religiously pluralistic society could successfully function. They would serve as a bulwark against any influence that diminished New Netherland history, especially against the ongoing tide of Yankee settlers and their strong preference for the English past. In Vanderkamp's mind, the way forward for New York was through the Dutch past. So for Vanderkamp, the connection to the Dutch was readily apparent, and it was a lived reality for him and his family in Oneida County. As I mentioned, by 1797, Vanderkamp lived in a state that was the former Dutch colony. He lived on a tract of land owned and given to him by a Dutch company in a village, Olden Barneveld, named after one of the most prominent figures in Dutch history, in an area of New York dominated by the Holland Land Company, all of which the land was superintended by Dutch employees, who also happened to be his friends and neighbors. It was hard to get more Dutch than that. But even as Vanderkamp encountered these daily reminders of the Dutch impact on the United States, it became increasingly clear that he had been insulated from larger developments that led most of his fellow New Yorkers to forget their Dutch past. There was a persistent notion that Dutch influence ended with the collapse of the colony, making the erasure of the Dutch a process long in the making. Of course, this dated back to the first English conquest of New Netherland in 1664. So the burgeoning success of New Netherland, the rise of the Dutch in, in the Atlantic world, threatened the expansive visions of the English in North America, which set off a quick succession of Anglo-Dutch wars. Um, so there were three Anglo-Dutch wars 
um, in the 17th century. And then there was a fourth Anglo-Dutch war, which was in fact one of the catalysts for Vanderkamp and others during the Patriot Revolt. So after some back and forth, after 1664, New Netherland permanently became part of the English Empire in 1674. The role and relative impact of the Dutch settlers who remained in the area after English conquest was and still is a matter of debate. So New Netherland itself had been an amalgam of many different peoples. And in fact, people from the Netherlands proper uh, barely represented a majority of the residents, which complicated questions of Dutch ethnicity and identity. There is, however, strong evidence that despite the loss of New Netherland, or in fact because of it, uh, Dutch culture and customs remained a central part of New York society. So after 1674, an ever-growing English presence in what it was now New York pushed Dutch residents to promote a greater and more unified sense of their own Dutchness through religion, social custom, and especially language. So the use of Dutch in both public and private situations was a constant and constantly commented on feature of New York life even after the revolution. In fact, when the Vanderkamps arrived to the United States, to New York in 1788, the welcoming party, which included uh, Governor George Clinton as well as Alexander Hamilton, greeted him in Dutch. But these features existed in spite of English efforts to erase Dutch culture and the Dutch past. So while these vestiges of the Dutch still remained in the United States, during the American Revolution, they went through another round of diffusion. Uh, as Americans unmade the coercive connections that had made them British, uh, the kind of forcible connections to Parliament, forcible connections to a British identity, it shifted the nature of national identity to a voluntary association and promoted the alchemy of white peoples residing in the United States. Dutch descendants found that being Dutch and being American were no longer mutually exclusive, and the preservation of a distinct Dutch identity lost the salience it had um, after conquest. So yet, as the colony of New York transitioned to the state of New York, it moved even further away from New Netherland um, and the history of the Dutch and its influence on that region. The contribution of New Netherlanders seemed even more distant to post-revolutionary Americans. Vanderkamp, who had found constant reminders of the Dutch colony, could not, uh, found that the same could not be said of his fellow New Yorkers. So time obviously accounts for some of this ignorance, but there were also particular developments in the early 19th century, in the early American Republic, that created an existential crisis in Dutch American history. It was these events that convinced Vanderkamp that the project, the Albany Records, was not simply useful, but necessary. So first was the demographic explosion of Yankees into New York after the revolution. Um, as constant and economic and geographic rivals there had long been deep tensions between Yankees and Yorkers during the colonial period, and those disputes carried over into the Union nation. Yankee migrants complained about New York architecture, the state of religion, uh, and even the traditional Dutch water spouts um, in many of the villages in upstate New York. They saw Yorkers as backwards, lazy, and incompetent. The newcomers especially criticized all the features of Yorker culture that were the most Dutch. So by the time Vanderkamp received his first batch of records, New York's population included a significant portion of Yankees that had no direct connection to the state's Dutch past. Further, they preferred their own colonial past from New England. So as Joy's good friend notes, quote, the New Netherland Dutch surrender not only their colony, but the power of controlling to telling of their own story. So compounding this Yankee influx was the picture of New Netherland in Washington Irving's A History of New York. So in Irving's telling, through the fictitious historian Diedrich Knickerbocker, the New Netherland Dutch were perpetually tired, hungry, and aloof. The book was first published in 1809, and it became an instant and massively popular book. The bumbling portrait of the Dutch in Irving's comic history created for many readers their only conception of New Netherland and its inhabitants. It's, it's much the same way, right, when, when people today replace a movie with actual information of history. It'd be like understanding the American Revolution through the Patriot. Um, and so stemming from Irving's account, most depictions of the Dutch in New York were antiquarian, and it kind of hermetically sealed the Dutch in a past um, and in the timeline of the colony. Um, in a process that Judith Richardson has labeled ghosting, Dutch colonists, or colonists became unmoored from their own history, and they emerged in literature and folklore as static historical figures 
ghosts of the past that haunted but did not intrude upon the present. So ghosting marginalized the Dutch as relics of a bygone age, forever frozen in time, with no bearing on the future of the United States. Irving, in fact, followed up his history in York with other short stories about fictional Dutch characters. Of course, in his short story, Rip Van Winkle, the main character literally encounters the ghosts of Henry Hudson and his crew of the Have Maine. They seem distant and importantly, so different from Americans. And there was this overriding sense that Dutch American history was fundamentally different from American history and that the colony was unimportant to the development of the country. The fictional account of Irving's Knickerbocker and even Rip Van Winkle really exposed the dearth of information about the Dutch and the Dutch colony in early Republic New York, despite having all of these records. Well, some of that was because the early engagement with the documents left much to be desired. So in 1798, Samuel Miller was trying to write a definitive history of New York. And in trying to research the part of the Dutch colony, he wrote to the state legislature and had a list of questions that he wanted to ask. Uh, so tellingly, he didn't know when the colony was founded. Uh, he didn't know basic information about any parts of the Dutch history. More than anything, Miller was surprised to find that the Dutch records were written in Dutch, a language he couldn't read, and he eventually abandoned the project. In 1804, the state passed an act to facilitate the translations, even appointing James Van Ingen in 1805, someone who actually had Dutch language skills, um, the state renewed the act in 1813, but by 1817, Van Ingen had barely touched the records. And so from Miller to Van Ingen, Dutch history in New York was in a completely woeful place. And it was in this moment, after years of Anglo-centric or comic histories of New Netherlands, uh, of treating the Dutch as apparitions from the past, uh, when too little was known about the Dutch in America, that Van der Kemp produced these 24 volumes of Dutch history. So to, despite his missteps, Vanderkamp's efforts with the Albany records pushed back against the erasure of the Dutch and promoted Dutch American history. As he wrote Adam, John Adams after finishing the project, quote, I often deeply regret that the real services of the Dutch towards America have been and are yet so generally undervalued. And every New Yorker who dares to consult the translated Dutch records much blush with shame and confusion when he reflects what this state is owing to the administration of a Stuyvesant. For his part, John Adams agreed, writing, quote, I modestly blush for my nation when I consider the same Freud, the nonchalance with which they have received the manifold testimonies of the esteemed confidence and affection of the Dutch toward the United States and the low estimation in which we have held the importance of their connection with us. The Albany records did increase interest in New Netherland during the early Republic and the role of the Dutch in American history. Vanderkamp's history also provided a corrective to the extant histories of the colony or even the kind of comic histories written by Irving. So instead of a, a group of bumbling, lazy colonists, Vanderkamp's narrative was full of enterprising Dutch settlers who were stalwart defenders of individual liberty. The English, by contrast, appeared not as conquerors but as jealous adversaries. It was a much different portrait than New Yorkers had experienced and even helped influence changes to Irving's more famous account. So in 1842, Washington Irving issued a new and revised edition of the history of New York. He apologized and reassured readers he didn't mean for the Dutch to come away as such a comical group of people. And he sought to redress his errors, utilizing the work that had been done on the colony since 1809. The specific source that Irving utilized was E.B. O'Callaghan's History of New Netherland. O'Callaghan, of course, relied heavily on Vanderkamp's Albany records. More than simply appreciation or acknowledgement, Vanderkamp wanted people to see in New Netherland what he saw, namely the pluralistic origins of the United States. The ethnic diversity that became a hallmark of American society, according to Vanderkamp, was most clearly seen in the Dutch colony. And New Netherland provided a primer on how a colony or a state or a country could be successful in spite of divisive politics and religious disputes. It revealed the ways in which ordinary people could challenge authority and promote individual freedom. As Vanderkamp wrote, quote, in reading these petitions, so bold, so persevering, considering these associations in this state, I see the embryo, seed, of revolutionary principles which were in time to be developed. American liberty itself, for Vanderkamp, was in part a Dutch creation. 
Vanderkam took immense pride in his opportunity and felt a heavy responsibility to restore New Netherland to a place of prominence for posterity. As he labored, the records consumed his correspondence. There was hardly a letter between 1817 and 1822 that didn't mention them. Uh, he wrote to Adams. He wrote to Jefferson. He wrote to Clinton. Anyone he was writing to, he was writing about what he was finding. He was writing about what he was reading um, about New Netherland. And so um, the image of New Netherland that emerged from Vanderkam's account was this multicultural society based on the pursuit of political and religious liberty. It was a society that sought creative and adaptive solutions to the problems of diversity and conflicting levels of political authority. So in the years after completing the records, Vanderkam continued to discuss his work, especially with John Adams. Both men realized that the records were but a first step to correcting the historical record. As the distance from the revolution and, of course, the colony only increased, the Americans who had welcomed the Banner Camps to the United States began to die and the memories of the Dutch involvement with them. With the completion of the translations, Adams wrote to Banner Camps that he, quote, hoped the Knickerbockers in America will be excited to assert the dignity of their nation. But he admitted that Americans had a low estimation in which we have held the importance of their connection with us. But Adams maintained that the treaty between the Netherlands and the United States had been a turning point in the American Revolution, and in some future day may, thought, may be thought of as, for, as more important. However, Adams wrote, if any Americans, particularly those in his own family, quote, do not recognize the obligations of this country to Holland, it will prove them in ignorance, inattention, and ingratitude unworthy of their name. Works such as the Albany Records were needed to combat the lack of awareness and promote more research on the Dutch in America and prevent Americans from forgetting their debt. With the records housed at the Capitol in Albany for anyone to access, Vander Kemp took his biggest and most public step toward countering the negligence of Dutch history in New York. Scholars who wanted to study the Dutch but did not read the language now had a powerful, albeit imperfect, resource. The records contained a picture of New Netherland and a full-throated defense of the Dutch influence in American history. It was a history that most Americans had never encountered and one that spoke to many of the same themes in the current literature on New Netherland. So while the official work on the Albany records began in 1818, the origin and inspiration for studying the interconnected history between the Dutch and America for Vanderkamp dated back all the way to 1781 when he first met John Adams and turned his full attention to the American Revolution. From then on, Vanderkamp sought to educate the Dutch and then Americans about their shared histories. So the Albany records reflect the importance of the early American Republic for studying the Dutch presence in America. Occupying the historical gap between the colony and the later 19th century immigration, the early American Republic at times gets overlooked in Dutch American histories. The longer history of the Albany records, the, the richer history helps to provide a bridge between the two most prominent periods of Dutch American history, as does Vanderkamp's own history. His life in New York emerged from Dutch connections, and he constantly blurred the influence of the two. Again, he farmed on a parcel of land granted from the Holland Land Company in a town named Olden Barneveld. He founded the United Protestant Religious Society and later the Reformed Church, based on principles he developed in the Netherlands and honed in the United States. The Reformed Christian Church, which actually still continues to hold services to this day as the Unitarian Church of Barneveld, stands as yet another reflection of the myriad ways the Dutch interconnect with America. Banner Kemp's work on the Albany records helps us to recognize the continued role of the Dutch in the creation of the United States. The Dutch and Dutch Americans continue to build, shape, and reshape the American landscape, and along with it, American culture. And in closing, the potential value of Banner Kemp's Albany records for Dutch American history was well known at the time as well as today. Uh, the work of, of Charles Gehring, Yanni Venema, and all of those at the New Netherland Research Center and the New Netherland Institute continue the important work of uncovering the history of New Netherland and the legacy of the Dutch in American history that Vanderkamp started all the way back in 1818. Of course, however, they're doing with much better translations. Thank you very much. <laughs>